We have been, in the last few days, discussing issues that have divided people in this country in serious, long-term ways. Some of those issues had to do with abortion. At the end of the hour, we're going to look at gun rights, Second Amendment rights. That's divided people in this country, still does. We're going to be talking about um, other issues that have done this. You can think of issues yourself. Immigration, that has divided people. Now I have a question for you, a very serious question. There are ills to a democracy. That wonderful politician Al Smith admitted there were ills in a democracy. And he said the cure of them was more democracy. But now I want to put you in a different frame of mind, one that you, I think, are not used to at all. But I'm asking you to use your imagination. I'm asking you to imagine what you would do if you wanted a democracy to fail. What would you do if you wanted to cripple a democracy and make its public discourse completely ineffectual? What would you do if you wanted to cause a country to implode against itself? What would be some of the things that you might do? Well, I think the, the best way to make politics ineffective and the message ineffective is to almost do to politics and politicians what Trump did to the media during the election. Almost paint it as something that everything they say is fake and everybody's corrupt. And at that point, they won't have any credence to their name and nobody will really actually listen to the debate. So you destroy a democracy by destroying the credibility of those in charge. Let's pause there. That's a very good point. We'll come across it later in this uh, course. We'll come across it when we read Benjamin Franklin on his reasons for ratifying the uh, uh, Constitution. All social order, all law is ultimately based on trust. If you don't trust authorities, if you don't trust the rule of law, if you don't trust the individuals, who are invested with the power to carry out that law, whether they are prosecutors or presidents or governors or members of the legislature or judges. If you don't trust those individuals with a fair degree of credibility, you have pretty much so gummed up the entire system. It will break down. The only thing that keeps American currency strong is that it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States, because the United States has not defaulted on a debt, at least not yet. There was a threat of defaulting on a debt fairly recently, and it alarmed some people a lot, because once you default on a debt, to go back to our earlier discussion, then maybe you have not always been honest about paying your debts. And if it happened once, maybe it'll happen a second time. Who knows? So trust is terribly important. So you, you want to destroy the trust. And one way to destroy the trust is say, they're all liars. The whole thing is rigged. None of it's true. Be suspicious of everything because nobody's being honest. Everyone involved in public life is gaming it. That's one way to do it. OK. Um, I think another thing is like beyond just causing distrust for politicians or the system, I think that you also need to foster distrust of anybody that supports those politicians. Yeah. And so I mean, I think that you could say that all the politicians that are in office are corrupt, but then you always have that hope that you'll just vote them out of office and vote other people in. But if you distrust the fundamental motives of those people that are doing the voting, then it undermines the whole system. Yes, so not only are you going to distrust politicians or elected officials or judges, but you're going to distrust a whole group of people who are unlike you, who hold views different than yours. And what's a way to do that? You could 
limit information within those factions to just being within the, that, those groups of people? So that yeah, you could live in a there. bubble. That's one way to do it. Don't read what anyone else says who doesn't agree with you because they don't agree with you. Keep to yourself, keep to the people who think like you do. That'll help. What else? I think get people to equate their identity with their political position so that yeah. that's the only framework that they yeah. see the world the in. The person I am is my politics. And if you don't agree with my politics, you must be some kind of person I don't want to be with or like. Did you know there's an increase in this country in personal ads that, in which people say, I will date only, say, a conservative, or I will date only a liberal? I never saw those in the personal ads in the 70s, 80s, or even the 90s. But now, you see it all the time. I don't want to be with anybody who thinks differently about politics than I do. I'm over here, you're over there. And this is, Katie, what you say has actually happened. If you plot the kinds of books that are read by people and what they order on Amazon, and you plot it according to political conviction, you'll see that increasingly the two so-called nodes of our politics have gotten farther and farther apart and that people tend to reinforce and read or listen to whatever TV shows or whatever it is that, that their own tribe listens to and the other tribe does that and there's, there's precious little left in the middle, increasingly so. It's like those personal ads. Philip? To make certain issues that could be simple into very complicated things that people can't talk about. So to make it overly complex. Yeah, you can make it very complex. I think in many cases, though, people might just turn off. Right, that's what I mean. Yeah, like, well, that might help. That might help. But that's not really nefarious enough. I want you to be, well, it, it's something you could do, but I want you to be really nefarious. Come on. Yeah. Let's go down here to come. Uh, this is an interesting exercise, ladies and gentlemen, because I believe it's actually happening. Uh, you can make it really difficult for people to vote, like still give them the you right to vote. You can do that, but... yep. Voter suppression, you can try that. That's, a, that's one thing you can try. You can gerrymander. And, you know, both parties have done this in the past in various ways. So, yes, but yes, you can. You can try to prevent people who vote who think you're going to vote in a certain way. What else? Not just call into question the motives of politicians, but also the impartiality of the organizations that are supposed to arbitrate our issues. So call into question law enforcement, yeah. call into question the judiciary, call into question the validity of elections. Yes, all of the above. Uh, but that's still not really, that's certainly what can be done. What else can be done? So you can do what's kind of been tried and true within like American history. So once you dilute somebody to this, their political identity, then you generalize and you stereotype those kind of people to almost dehumanize them. And then you're really just creating anti-factions between enemies um, once like you've just related these people to this one bad stereotype. Yes, uh, this dehumanization is not uncommon in authoritarian states. You end up calling people not people. You literally call them something else. And when we get close to genocidal situations, you begin to call them insects or animals or bugs or creatures or something else. I'm not exaggerating. This has happened many times. You do not dignify them with the word person or human. You use another demeaning word, usually of a lower form of animal life. There, there are other things here. We're getting, we're getting a pretty good list. Uh, and unfortunately, it's a list that uh, has been practiced to some degree. Um, I think through fake news, conspiracy theories, disinformation, what have you, you can create an uh, environment of civic discourse in which facts don't matter. Yeah. Which you can choose your own yeah, information. Yeah, you can. And indeed, this is something which I think is very worrisome. Because then you have created a realm of public discourse which is so infected and so questioned that the tendency is for it to become even more divisive. And in doing so, you would pick particular issues that are especially divisive. In other words, you're not, you're not going to pick the local playground whether it should have a three-foot fence or a six-foot fence. You're going to pick issues such as 
immigration. You're going to pick issues such as discrimination. You'll pick issues such as the economy and whether it's doing well or not. And what you will try to do is to get people in that democracy to attack each other and distrust each other as we've already described. So that the trust and credit is no longer in the government and it's no longer in the people themselves. The country is divided. And furthermore, it is rabidly divided, meaning the emotion runs very high. It's very strong. And when you have succeeded in doing that, you have succeeded in pouring a great deal of sand and grit into the wheels of any democracy. It can be done. It has been done. And as we mentioned earlier, fear is a part of it. Hope can be a part of it. But it is a dangerous thing. Democracies are fragile. There is nothing especially self-correcting about them. If you distrust all authority, there is no authority to come in and regulate order. You distrust the police, then the police aren't going to be of much help. They'll be the enemy. Now, there's a comment made about Senator Joe McCarthy, which is a true comment. And I want to mention it because it shows how touchy this situation is. McCarthy said a lot of things that were false. Did he say some things that were true? Yes, he did. So when you examine what is said in these arguments, including the divisive ones, you should always remember that in every argument, no matter how repulsive, there is usually some element of truth. And that is what makes argumentation sometimes such a difficult affair. Because your opponent and those supporting your opponent and you yourself will have to admit that as dark and as repulsive as you might find certain arguments, there is a modicum of truth in them. That is almost always the case. And that makes the responsibility for separating out what is true from what is not true enormous. And we talked about this earlier. You're growing up in a kind of universe of information that I certainly did not. And I think that universe of information is becoming more fraught F-R-A-U-G-H-T, more contentious, harder to judge, more divisive. And I worry that in that process, it is making democracy harder to conduct, just harder. And of course, at a certain point, the temptation for some people when they see this is no longer to participate, just bail out. Don't go back to what you said, Seth. No one's to be trusted. Everything is rigged. I'm not going to participate. I don't make a difference. What happens in a democracy when enough people say, I don't make a difference? Not a party, but... Yeah, well, you don't have a democracy anymore eventually, yes. You don't have a democracy anymore. And have foreign powers apparently been trying to do some of these things that we mentioned today? Well. They've been indicted for it. Foreign individuals have been indicted for it. Whether they will ever stand trial, I do not know. But it is a tactic. And it is a tactic that turns democracy against itself from the inside. It turns people in the democracy against themselves. It is not foreign, as it were, propaganda. It is propaganda inserted within the democracy that becomes a kind of infection. I bring it up, I dwell on it, because increasingly I am very worried about it. I am very worried about it changing the political landscape. I'm very worried about the fact that people your age have a much lower voting rate than people my age. I don't think it should be that way. I think young people ought to vote for the country they want, no matter what their political convictions are. 
They ought to. But they vote at a much lower rate than folks my age. So if 20 years from now you're living in a country and you don't particularly like some aspects of it, you can blame a lot of people, but if you didn't vote and you had the right to vote, you might look at yourself. That's ultimately where the power rests, ultimately. All right, well, we don't have too much time left, but I wanted to say that uh, in the case of democracy and deliberation, you have a situation in which I believe with Smith that the only cure for this is more deliberation. It has got to be that way, because without it, you're going to give in to either a minority power or to some kind of authority that you do not like and that you do not trust. So I ask you to read just a little in John Quincy Adams. And I want to close with one of the points he makes, which is what he calls the rule. And it's a rule. There aren't too many rules in rhetoric. Have you noticed I haven't mentioned the word rule too much? You must do this. You must do that. Say so you don't always have to have this many parts. You don't always have to do. But this is a rule that Adams lays down. And I think it's one worth thinking about. He calls it the rule of sincerity, meaning you should never try to convince someone else of something that you yourself are not thoroughly and honestly convinced of yourself for the very reasons that you state. In other words, it's a way of removing cynicism and chicanery from an argument. And Adam says this is a very important thing. Now, at the same time, he even says, if you appeal to a certain kind of audience that isn't very well educated, you have to talk to them. And if you appeal to another audience that's well educated, you have to appeal to them in a different way. But no matter whom you're appealing to, he says you must absolutely be sincere. That there is an ethical obligation for that. Now, I can't argue that in deductive reasoning. But I can say that if you come across an orator or a politician or a leader who is not sincere, in the end, I think the results will undercut themselves. And you will be disappointed. When Abraham Lincoln is elected president, he takes, before he's inaugurated, he takes a train trip. And he ends up in Philadelphia. He ends up in Independence Hall. And he gives a little address there. And he says, I stand before you and sincerely say that I believe in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Northwest Ordinance. And if I ever violate one of those, I sincerely say I wish to be assassinated on the spot. He actually says that. He says that. This is before he takes the oath of office. He knows what's at stake, just the way King later knew what was at stake. He knows that when you push things to the wall that way, people get desperate. And so that's what he says. I went through as many letters of Abraham Lincoln as I could find in various editions. And the way he usually signs his letters are, yours truly, or truly. He almost never signs them sincerely. But he signs one letter sincerely. And that is a letter he writes to a woman named Mrs. Bixby. Lincoln was under the impression, it later turned out not to be true, but he was under the impression that she had lost five sons fighting in the war. It was bad enough. She'd lost two. One other was missing and another wounded, and I don't know what happened to the fifth. But at any rate, Lincoln thought she had lost everyone. And he said, I will not attempt to beguile you from your grief for a family that has done so much to sacrifice. It's a short classic letter. You might look it up. And then he signs it, sincerely yours, Abraham Lincoln. One of the very, very few times he uses that close. Adam's rule of sincerity is something to keep in mind because I think it keeps us honest. And it changes rhetoric from simply a mode of persuading, like a hired gun, to a mode in which it is your way of thinking. It becomes a way of thinking, not just a way of saying, but it becomes a way of analyzing and thinking. 
about issues that demand that kind of treatment, issues that are not absolutely logical, issues that are not absolutely provable, but issues that are very contentious and divisive. 